Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to week two of our Visiting Artist Lecture Series as part of the La Res Summer Intensive. Everybody in here knows me, but I'm Laura Hughes, co-chair of the program, along with Jody Cavalier. And it's our pleasure tonight to have Tanaz Farsi as our visiting artist for the lecture. Um, I can go into this spiel about the program, we're all aware of it, but yes, we're, um, this is gonna be the sec second out of our seven um, lectures, and all of them are up posted at the front there. So um, come back and join us, and those of you who are students, you're required to be here. So <laughs> anyway, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Brittany Gibson, who is going to be introducing Tanaz, giving us a little bit more background information about her. Okay, thanks. Hi there. It's my pleasure to introduce Tanaz Farsi, and I'm excited to have a studio visit with her tomorrow. Her work represents objects and images that start from a collective experience found in current news or a cultural archive. Her work has been exhibited locally in venues such as PICA, Portland Institute of Contemporary Art, and Dischecta. She also has exhibited her work nationally at venues such as Pitzer Art Galleries in Claremont, California, the Tacoma Art Museum, in Washington, Delaware Center for Contemporary Art, and the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She has been granted residencies at Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, UCross Foundation, the McDowell Colony, and Santa Fe Art Institute. Tanaz is faculty at the University of Oregon and was recently awarded a fellowship from the Oregon Arts Commission. She is a featured artist in this summer's Portland Biennale showing at the Morin Print Building in the Dales and Broadway Library Gallery in the College of the Arts at Portland State University. Please welcome Tanaz Farsi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brittany, for uh, that wonderful welcome. And thank you, Laura and Jody, for inviting me, inviting me down here to uh, visit the program and talk about my work. Oh, how did we get there? <laughs> okay. You know what? Um, there we go. There we go. I want to, I generally don't talk about uh, work, graduate school work, but I wanted to kind of introduce, since, since I'm here speaking to the MFA program in, in particular, I wanted to introduce a couple of uh, pivotal moments that I had during my graduate education and then we're going to move kind of chronolo chronologically forward and I'm going to talk about a few of the projects I've done over the years and, and end in my studio at this very moment where I have been very, very busy uh, finishing up work. I, I was born and uh, raised in Iran and my family moved to the United States during the 1980s, during the Iran-Iraq war. And this experience has uh, made me very, uh, has been really instrumental for, for me obviously as a person and also my work. And a lot of the work that I do is concerned with uh, notions of diasporic identity and how um, how this, this type of shifting across continents, across cultures, affects, affects uh, one's relationship to uh, national identity, ethnicity, and so on. Uh, the first image I wanna talk about is, uh, I, I saw this image, which is a portrait by uh, Phil Collins of the Iranian poet Abbas Amini in 2000. Uh, three, he sewed his mouth and eyes shut uh, in protest of being sent back to Iran when he was seeking refuge in, in Britain. And uh, I found this image, of course, so horrifying, but it also really shifted the way I started to think about my own work. I started becoming, becoming interested in real things, uh, real materials, real uh, scale, scale that's kind of related to the human size. And I started to move away from my previous work, which uh, was based in ceramics and dealt with images and uh, text as well, but in a much more miniaturized scale. So I started to kind of embark on this idea of installation and, uh, and thinking about 
how uh, an image could possibly evoke a sensibility that uh, could bring anxiety to the body, could induce a certain kind of alteration in the way you think about the world around you. And so that image, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because the idea of sewing your lips and or the idea of sewing comes from this notion of mending, generally, right? We think about it as the idea of mending cloth or repairing of something. And, and to sew your body parts, something that isn't, hasn't been previously torn, it's obviously not an act of mending, but an act of silencing that can speak really loudly. I think that's one of the things that I was really struck by the kind of uh, material quality of that and its effect on, a, a, and, and its physical, physical effect. So that image, as much as it materially uh, really kind of rocked me out of a lot of my comfort zones of thinking and making, it also uh, maybe opened up some avenues to think about my own relationship to diaspora, of what it means to, uh, in, in some ways, be kind of a refugee or be a immigrant in this country, but have lost a kind of connection to what, it, what a homeland could be. So I started uh, with this piece, and uh, this is one of the first installations I did where I uh, created this room that I painted in this uh, kind of an off-white color. I just wanted a kind of a uniformity to happen through the work. So, so I've, I've measured the parts of my body and made these two pieces of clothing for myself and then filled them in air so that a body couldn't possibly occupy it. And in relationship with that, I, I created these, this kind of performance where I was um, writing these letters to Abbas Amini and uh, sealing them and dipping them in this, in this kind of liquid that seals the envelope. So there was this, uh, I don't know, this kind of sense of longing about wanting to connect to something that um, was culturally familiar, but at the same time, um, the inability to do so. And, and I don't know, now that I th think about it, it's just like reaching to a lot of different places. And I think a lot of my work does that. It doesn't necessarily tend to rationalize the ideas that I'm thinking about, but it tends to, in some ways, be comprehensive um, outlook on the, 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 the kind of clouds of ideas that form around, around a thing. So this was also in the room, as you saw in the first image, and projected on this, um, on this kind of plexiglass space is this video of my absent body um, kind of conversing, conversing with this image. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. flip back to the first image. I was at this time really uh, infatuated with 60s and 70s performance artists, uh, people like uh, Chris Burden, Anna Mandietta, and so forth, and really uh, wanted to explore that kind of uh, relationship of the body to an audience, and but, but didn't necessarily feel comfortable with placing my own body in space. So in this period, I really used video as this kind of absent way of performing and being present. So in some ways, everything in the room becomes a kind of a leftover of the activity that has happened there. And one more piece, my final piece that I did in, in grad school. Um, some of the ways that I started to think about the notion of diaspora had to do with this kind of relationship, this kind of universality that it could pose with regards to technology. Um, I was 
I am still, but I was at that moment particularly interested in, in reading a lot of science fiction and, uh, and thinking about the idea that our tools in some way have created this distance between us uh, similarly to the ways that pe people leave their kind of countries or ethnicity or their culture. And so uh, with this work, I, I, I was really kind of interested in uh, maybe thinking about a place where language did not exist, and in, in a sense, the, the hierarchy of lang language was trumped by this notion of physical being in space. And so there are these kind of multiple parts and pieces, uh, these cast kind of helmets that sit on the wall, these long tubes that were installed in space that one would traverse through, and then there are these two kind of nine minute videos of me performing different kinds of things such as uh, drinking, drinking a lot of water until it becomes uncomfortable or holding my breath underwater. So these just very kind of minute uh, daily activities that when they're just pushed slightly to the edge start to become slightly uncomfortable. Uh, here, let me get, this is a documentation of the installation. The title of this work is called Self-Haunted and Synthetic, and it is uh, as a title, it's, it's a sentence, part of a sentence that I took from one of Don DeLillo's novels. And, uh, you know, one of the th things I did in school, I studied a lot of, um, of, I took a lot of film classes, and I was really into avant-garde filmmaking, and so I was interested in using some of those conventions or misusing some of those conventions towards installation. So I'll just read a little bit that I have written about this. My work borrowed from avant-garde cinematic structures such as nonlinear narratives, duration, and the gaze in order to create an immersive experience within an installation. The work utilized the abstraction of form, the use of the multiple audio and video to create a sensory internalized world for the viewer. I was interested in the psychological richness posed through the use of materials that were mostly physically transparent with a minimal approach to construction, the arrangements of forms in conjunction with a barely perceptible materiality was used to elicit a primal or bodily response that could exist outside of language. So, so there is this kind of sensibility. You see the flicker of the light and the kind of dimness in the room really altered the way you navigated the space or where you felt in the space. It seems like you were kind of out of time or out of place in some way or the other. I find that there's been a significant shift in my work from uh, working in, in that manner to the way maybe that I currently work in that um, I, it's not so much that I, I'm, my intention is to disrupt the hierarchy of language, but in, in some ways to kind of flip back to its opposite, to uh, use objects that function as a sign and contextually start from a collective experience. So I came across this uh, particular image of Richard Serra. This is a Richard Serra drawing and a poster on the right-hand side in, uh, at the 2006 Whitney Biennial. It seems so long ago now. And I was really struck because it was um, uh, a few years after the Abu Ghraib atrocities. And so there was, uh, this image had already become so well known. And for those of you that may not know it, uh, it's an image of one of the Abu Ghraib prisoners that was uh, put on a box. And, and uh, there are wires that are coming out of his fingertips. Uh, and, and he's covered in this kind of cloak. And so it, it, um, it you know, n n needless to say, it is a very, um, uh, the image itself is a, is a very disruptive image. It's a very violent image. And I was, I was kind of really curious about the use of this, the reappropriation of that image, and also the kind of quality of, um, what is it? There's like, what kind of timing do, do images have in the way that we receive them or we understand them culturally? So my intention is to render tangible 
the philosophical and ideological ideas that are consequential in governing our everyday lives yet remain abstract when applied to societal wholes, and specifically how news and imagery of the Mideast structures a type of expectation from its Western audience in a post-9-11 world. So I was kind of interested in the appropriation of the image, as I already said, and uh, in its first instance of reproduction as the original image, and as well as the timeliness of using it several years later after the release of the files. And in my work, I think, you know, I am similarly interested in and invested in the ways that widely circulated images, which clearly and authoritatively frame particular moments, can be unpacked and reused to address the nuance of how we devour and forget important moments in our history. I was thinking about this with regards to Orlando, you know, like how, you know, there are these things of waves that come into our psyche and we are so distraught about it and then they're gone. And there's, it's just like, it's like a continual way that uh, we live in a state of amnesia of things that, that happened to us. And so, yeah, I think that this work, in essence, had to do a lot to do with that. Uh, so this work was made three years later after the fact, and, um, or, or yes, when the, when the actual images, the whole files were, were, released, uh, into, were released to the public. And I wanted to think about a way of looking at an image and making, turning it into an object. So I used the dimensions of the image, how I imagined the man's height would fall and how his spread arms would you know, reach to the side. And so that created the span of the fluorescent lights. And in front of the fluorescent box, uh, fluorescent lights, there was this box this kind of disjunction of how the body stood on the box, that, that disjunction separated uh, the body from, you know, that hung, hangs on the wall in, in the form of fluorescent lights and the box itself. So I'll read, I really like the, the description of this, so I'll just read it to you. 11 U-shaped fluorescent tubes hang side by side as a closed circuit that indicate the width of the prisoner's arm. The height is similarly derived from the dimensions of the body in the original image. The wires that electrify these lights remain visible and connote simultaneously the body in, the, in their mimicry of hair as well as topographic map lines terminating in a steel box that houses the electrical units. So the, one of the kind of interesting things that I was reading at the time that informed uh, the way that I destructured this photograph had to do with um, George Bataille. He names three things that are extremely visible yet remain unseen. He cites the sun, genitals, and death as forms that in their insistence of presence create a type of blindness. And similarly, I was exploring this kind of Blindness, blindness that was brought about by the violence that is uh, that is in the original image, and I wanted to conceptually substitute that violence in some ways to cover the body in light rather than in in pain. So in two thousand uh, in two thousand nine, I was uh, I was invited to go to the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and it was a um, it was a three month residency, and it's a kind of an amazing space because it's a live work space. There aren't haven't been too many residencies that I've gone to that you live and work in the same giant room. <laughs> And uh, there's a kind of mania that happens <laughs> when you're in there all day long and your kitchen is there and you don't ever have to leave. You can just get up and do what you will. Um, simultaneously, the 2009 uh, uprising, the green movement was happening in Iran when I, was, uh, when I was, had this really focused amount of time in the studio. And, and so I, I um, became kind of obsessed with following uh, this kind of... Uh, amazing event, so, so the event is that the, the elections were happening in Iran and uh, the, the, the person that won the election was disqualified or the votes weren't correctly counted and so the people's votes were discounted and this is what happened, people took to the street. And it's kind of amazing because since the 1978 revolution, you never see pictures of Iran with this kind of mob 
mob formation in the street. So this was a really amazing moment. And, and also another kind of amazing fact about it is if you Google this, all you see is also a picture of women in the street. So Iranians have this kind of thing around revolution and women, <laughs> which I find also really kind of uh, uh, amazing that, that, that uh, the, the presence of women within these public spaces were very, very notable. So, um, so the residency at, at Bemis allowed me to focus on research and practice that characterized, characterized the studio as a simultaneous site of production and protest. I was very much involved in a form of living history through the use of internet sites such as the BBC, the New York Times, Facebook, and Twitter, where the diasporic community was able to unite and give voice to the struggles of the protesters through virtual connectivity. Effectively, the distance between the physical site of resistance and the virtual site of dissent was conflated. Communication through a set of impermanent hyperlinks and postings made me question the form that a revolution can take and reaffirmed the necessity of multiple platforms and duration in recalling an event. I'm particularly interested in the works of the social historian Michel Foucault and his writing on resistance to strategies of power. Foucault was initially a great supporter of the Iranian Islamic Revolution, and he wrote three articles for the French publication Le Monde that covered the duration of the revolution. But um, his support for the theocracy obviously was discounted for, <laughs> by, by many uh, leading uh, thinkers of, of the time. But one thing that I really loved about uh, one of the essays that he wrote, um, uh, titled Is It Useless to Revolt?, uh, he describes his own position as anti-strategic, a position that is not based on moral or normative ideology. And he states, it's through revolt that subjectivity introduces itself into history. So there's something interesting about that way of engaging with political ideas that has been really important for my work, that, that the subjectivity has a place in that, that there's something about rewriting history, like th that history can't be necessarily written through normative powers. And not that I necessarily align my work with uh, the, as being political. I feel like it's firmly rooted within an art making practice. But I, I do think that this is where actually, uh, interestingly, people become engaged and aware. This is how I became engaged and aware as, as a person through looking at other people's works of art that dealt with um, maybe difficult subject matter. So, so I, I'm kind of interested in how art can actually have a place within that conversation. Uh, so these are some of the works that came out of that, uh, those months of kind of thinking and ruminating and being on Twitter and, and you know, Facebook, et cetera, and just also thinking about um, the, the distance of, of what it means in some ways to come from a place, but then uh, so much of your life is important, informed by other things, the privilege of being in other places, I should say. Uh, yeah, the title of this exhibition was called The Future Belongs to Crowds. Another sentence from Don DeLillo's, one of Don DeLillo's books, uh, Mao Tu. Um, and, and I wanted in some ways to figure out a way to kind of commemorate this event. And so one of the things, you know, the, the, the um, the bullhorn kind of is really, um, uh, it speaks to itself as far as its, its meaning. But these roses, I, I was kind of curious about what makes a crowd, how do you kind of incite a crowd, how many people do you need in order to kind of relegate something as a crowd. And so I, I glittered a thousand roses in, in kind of the in, in, event, in memory of this event and these roses uh, stayed on the ground until they died during the month-long exhibition. And the third piece, and these I'm shooting separately because the exhibition was in such a tiny space that you couldn't actually get the uh, relationship of what it would be like in the space, so I've shot these uh, separately. But uh, the third piece that went along with that is titled, I Forgot. And I'll read you a little bit about this piece. 
One of the pieces in this installation is a large scale object that is comprised of the words, I forgot, propped up by fluorescent tubes. The object mimics a sign whose form could be readily imagined on top of buildings or found in the language of advertising. Consequently, the accessibility of this form within the realm of sign is complicated by the association the viewer may have with the phrase, leading them to contemplate what it is they have forgotten. In the essay, The Gift of Present, anthropologist Miles Richardson states, the capacity to reflect back upon the flow of experience permits us to reify that experience into an entity and give it a name. Me, you, us, words give us the power to name, but the same reflexive power that resides in words also resides in artifacts. Analogously, I forgot conflated the mundane to the historical by spanning the forgetting of your keys to forgetting genocide, an opportunity to create a monument that isn't generated through the proclamation of power but the understanding of human fallibility. The words made into physical form create an artifact of an event that was easily erased from public physical space to exist only within the imaginary. These are also a couple of other, other works that kind of came out of that time as well, of being in the studio and not leaving it. Through my practice, I use ready-made objects commercially produced and distributed as an identifiable language to reconstruct history. I also use the potential of ready-made forms, such as the Iranian flag, my Gmail account, consecrated building structures and texts that hold creative resonance and collective meaning in order to deconstruct and reassemble meaning. This is a piece uh, of news and reclamation uh, that I was kind of interested in thinking about the, flag, the Iranian flag and thinking about what makes an object a national object or an ethnic object or yeah, how, do, how, do, how do you kind of classify what a flag is? How do you, how do you rally around it? What, what is it, this substance that's made out of thread or three stripes or three colors? How does it kind of take on this larger than life kind of quality? So in uh, 2010, I used the Iranian flag as an attempt at dismantling the national emblem away from the connotation of go governmental and Islamic politics. The flag was conceptually con deconstructed to question the monolithic power that is assumed under three stripes of horizontal color, fabric, and pattern, that which constitutes the physical makeup of the flag as an object. I was interested in framing the site of the flag as a simultaneously physical and psychic space in order to recontextualize this object of nationalism through the lens of perception and protest. For example, one of the colors of the flag, excuse me, for example, one of the components of this piece is created out of 120 fluorescent bulbs that are placed on top of a condensed colors of the flag. And one of the things that I wanted to do, so, so the colors of the Iranian flag are white, green, and red, and the middle um, is a repetition of the word, God is great, God is great, God is great, 22 times. And so I really wanted to kind of take that apart and remove uh, the symbolic kind of center of it, which is the uh, Arabic word for God. Allah is written in the middle of it. So I, I pulled those three colors apart and reconstructed them into different things. So the green in some ways became the cinder blocks, this kind of context of rebuilding, like the idea of, um, uh, of things that you see within a street that has been broken down and being rebuilt in, in, in time. And also the, the red became this color of protest rather than this color of blood. And, and it's, uh, it's kind of shaped into this large protest banner that needs two people to carry it and really kind of signals this idea of the street. So here is the, and the green energy, you know, the green is just so symbolic of growth and rebirth, et cetera, on the flag. This is a close up of, um, of the, the color red being transferred into the, letter of, uh, into uh, this, 
the color red being transferred into the state of protest. And what, it's kind of complicated because what the Iranian frag actually says is, uh, God is greater than everything. So what I had written on this flag on a larger, larger scale is greater than everything. And that area was peeled into skin. So it was like an absence where paint covered up and started to sag and, and shift and move. And these are the, the 120 lights that were stacked on top of each other to kind of reconstruct the flag without the symbolic center of God being related to this national object. And so I, I thought a lot about, this is a, my old studio and uh, you can kind of see the flag being made. I made a couple of them to kind of figure it out. And um, I love this whole process so much more than what the work is, of course. You know, there's something like really alive in, in this moment in a, in a very different way or like there's that activity or performance that actually connects it to its intention. And uh, the, I've, you know, yeah, I think that there's something about that with, with art making, with work. It's like the process is really different. The process of making is really different than the process of thinking and how do you reconcile those things. Um, but I like the second version of this uh, idea better, flag number two, where it is actually the paint drop cloth that had the, um, the protest banner and then the rollers. I was like, oh, this is actually the perfect flag, the perfect flag is this, and why did I spend all that time making that work? Because <laughs> this is actually really good. So yeah, I think that there's something kind of interesting about I how ideas exist, um, and the work exists, and they come together sometimes, and they diverge. And I'm especially thinking about this because I'm so heavily, I'm like not in the space of thinking about work, I'm really actually in this very much space of making work, and I've, I've been thinking about that dissonance of where the work itself, the physicality of making something takes you and what happens to it in its aftermath or afterlife where you kind of think about it and write about it and connect it to the larger kind of constructs of um, ideas. This is, uh, this is titled Losing Themselves in a Distance to Faraway Heights. And uh, I, this was another piece that I created during a residency, and um, <laughs> it was really funny. I, I was at McDowell in this cottage in the woods, and the only thing I had was a jigsaw. So that was like really fun. Every day I went out there and carved my letter, carved my letters, or uh, cut my letters out of a thin piece of board with a jigsaw, and that that was my like activity in nature. Um, but but yeah, so I, I started to kind of think about that idea of religion and wanted to push this notion of like, how do we separate cultural objects from national objects? How do they get to these kind of linked up to these ways that we think about governments or we think about punishment or we think about um, morality? Like how, how can we sort the differences within these structures? And I was really, um, I've been so fascinated by uh, the Kaaba, the Islamic house of God, and I wanted to, you know, it has this kind of draw for all Muslims from lots of places around the world, and it just seems like such an amazing way to engage physically with a site and through history. Simultaneously, it is a site that is, um, tr that has, in some ways, its laws have been translated in really particular ways, right, that have had adverse effects on groups of people. So I was just really curious about demystifying the space and uh, in some ways turning it into a place where uh, it could be a gathering, it could be a platform for the people to speak from rather than just a space for someone to rotate or for groups of people to rotate around. So uh, I was also kind of curious about working in a different way and connecting to an Iranian community. And so I sent out in my Gmail, I sent out uh, a, a kind of list to people asking them what it means to live their dream. And I got a lot of different kinds of responses back as to what, what, you know, what constitutes a dream for different people. And I did this particularly because I think about all of, um, in some ways, like I think about uh, all Iranians as refugees or as um, exiles because 
particularly in a country that is so uh, strictly, the entry and exit is strictly, so strictly guarded within its own country and to whatever country people want to move back and forth to. It's, it's kind of a tight border that, that it has created this kind of um, serious uh, break in its cultural foundation. Anyway, this is my, this is my thinking about this. And, and I wanted to kind of address that through this idea of what does it mean to live the dream and, and relating the dream back to this notion of, of, uh, of cultural, like a cultural togetherness. So yeah, so this is a scaled, uh, scaled version of the Kaaba that I built and open up the, the sides as a, as a place to kind of demystify it. And then also uh, there is a kind of like a, I don't know, it's a pretty long text piece that went along with it. But in, I'm just gonna forward and kind of come back. Uh, through my emails, what I asked was name, nationality, country of residence, ethnicity, and what does it mean to live the dream? And one of the interesting things that you know came back was everybody is kind of confused about nationality and ethnicity. So I was still dealing with some of the ideas that I brought up with the flag of like what what is a national object? What's a, what's a cultural object? You know, how do you like relate yourself to these things that seem so set while um, while while the kind of meaning around them is actually not so, not so static. And, and I think some of the most interesting ones had to do with the fact that um, there is this kind of lack of understanding around the idea of nationalism and ethnicity. Uh, so this was someone's response where they sent me a poem and the poem is, uh, what does it mean to be, it actually is, what it repeats itself, what does it mean to be Iranian? And it starts to kind of uh, uh, sing the history of, of occupation or colonialism through time, not just in the, in the modern era, but through time. Um, uh, this one, it, uh, <laughs> this one, he is, what, a friend of my aunt sent me this, who is a painter, sent me, this is what it means for him to live the dream. This was the portrait that he painted. So I got some kind of interesting things back and forth, and then this uh, was a writer that, um, let me see if I can move away and actually read this, because I don't think my thing is here. What does it mean to live your dream? Dreams of an exiled writer have two legs, one in the country she has lost, the other one in the country she tries to belong. These dreams at times, aspires to establish herself in the host land. In the worst of days, she feels like a lover who has lost the beloved. Dreams of an exiled writer are dreams of a schizophrenic patient. Two voices, two languages, two personalities, not always in battle, but pulling her here and there, tearing her apart. She writes to survive the agony of homelessness. So I, I get a, a lot of different um, responses, but I, I don't know if I actually resolved um, resolve the piece, <laughs> it's like one of those things that I want to go back to um, and, and think about some more because they ended up uh, being placed, I just printed out my Gmail and of course what I found interesting in my Gmail was that the tracking that happens in Gmail that I was getting all of these kind of advertisings for um, how to learn a second language and how to buy a rug and like all of these ways that Gmail starts to like really specifically target the kind of language that's in your email. So that was one of the reasons that uh, the Gmails became kind of part of it because they indexed uh, this conversation in very particular ways. But anyway, to go back to the beginning, um, this was kind of my answer to what, what it means to, to live the dream is to dream the living and I, you wanted to use uh, this text that was a little bit like calligraphy, that it became unrecognizable. I don't think most people actually knew that it said anything um, that they could read. They thought probably it was in Persian or something. But, uh, but yeah, I really liked the idea of kind of like that being voiced really loudly to dream the living rather than um, this kind of concentration on other things. This is the back of the piece. OK. 
Okay, now we're in 2013. So I think that there's something I do with my work that I like to move into in two different ways. I like the idea of um, hanging on to really specific moments in time and grappling with those issues and making work from that. And then I like the idea of going to internal spaces, you know, where things don't have to be rationalized and make sense. And I think that's like a really important way for me to think about um, uh, moving outside of like the didacticness of, of, of having art have to answer to something. I'm not necessarily interested in art having to answer to a very particular set of set of questions. So uh, I like this kind of shift between having really specific sources and then moving and allowing other things to enter the work um, and, and being informed by irrationality as much as it is with rationality. So in, in this work, I was been, had been thinking about barriers and borders and, uh, and I wanted to uh, look at a crowd control barrier. This happened kind of right around the time of Occupy where there was, there was so much of the crowd control barrier was such a kind of like a specific image that was, that was in the news. And I was really interested in seeing this kind of barrier as this really small space or like there's that the lines of division are almost invisible, right? Like what is it? How do you land on one side or the other of something? So I will read you a bit that I've written about this. In crowd control, I've transformed objects that highlight political divisions, namely a crowd control barrier and a flag in order to manifest the perceptual and emotional aspects associated with the visual vocabulary of conflict. For example, the crowd control barrier is a dividing marker that emphasizes a position of authority from one side to the other, asserting a right or a wrong, power to powerlessness, and dominance to subjugation. I wanted to address the true nature of this physical object, the dividing line, as something emotional and ungraspable. The French literary theorist Roland Barthes, writing on this, on the neutral, influenced the direction of this work. His cites Grissel, a term for paintings that are achieved through a monochrome as having the potential to present nuance, disrupting a unitary organization of a system. He views this as a place where the subjectivity of one's gaze can be asserted in the creation of meaning. The collective works that comprise this installation take the idea of neutral as a formal cue. The grayscale implicates the surface of each object in the installation, particularly prominent in the downturned flag form. By reducing an icon to a material without significance, I attempt to reverse the power of form into formlessness and to reevaluate the projection of one's nationalistic identity onto this object. So the, the kind of the flag comes back again here in, in a very different way. Rather than kind of deconstructing it but using its symbolic colors, I, I was interested in kind of erasing color completely from it. And uh, so, so this was the crowd control barrier that I kind of created out of light to play with that idea of neutrality or play with that idea of the kind of like invisible division. Um, and then this is one of the kind of word to text pieces that popped out from, the, there was a carryover from the Gmail, Gmail piece. So when you're not visible in Gmail, it says you're invisible on top. And I just like thought that was a really amazing thing to always look at something that tells you you're invisible. Um, because I was always invisible online, you know. But, but I, I, I just thought like, oh wow, there's like there are ways that um, this kind of condition is, uh, I don't know, it's always present, the idea of the invisibility. And I, I really liked in some ways how it didn't go back into like cultural specificity in this piece. It, it, was, it was a kind of a generalized way of thinking about our, in, our, I'll say our invisibility in face of, I don't know, the other and the other being like social or economic or um, ethnic or whatever it is. But I, I kind of like this kind of pull back from from very specific uh, cultural uh, ref references. Okay, I have a few more pieces that I wanna share with you. Um, this is a work that was at TBA. Uh, 
And as, as you probably know, my work is continued by now, because I've been talking about it a little bit, my work is continually influenced by my experience of other works of art, and, and this can span visual arts, writing, um, sound, theory, news, and images, all of those things. Uh, in, in this case, I saw a, um, a program of songs by Kurt Weil, and I was really struck by uh, the the singer who sang in German the song Mack the Knife. And it's, uh, it's from the ballad of, the, uh, it's from the Three Penny Opera. And it's a very popular song that has been covered by many artists. And there's this very particular stanza that really stuck, struck out to me. And it says, uh, some are in the dark and others are in the light. We see them in the light, in the dark we do not see them. And I, I just, um, there was something that about it that made Im suffering really emotional, you know, like a, a, and and real in a way. And again, didn't necessarily have to connect to a very particular way of thinking about ethnicity or or cultural identity. And uh, I started to kind of just work with this text of putting it into Photoshop and figuring out what I could do with it. Uh, the whole the the. Play itself is a critique on capitalism, and uh, and so there was a kind of an interesting way that it started to talk about really kind of current issues, you know, kind of current issues of of power and um, the disruption of the power of the of certain types of power in our society. So when I was uh, kind of trying to figure out what to do with this piece, I. A lot of times I'll just start in Photoshop and I have something and I, I toss this text into Photoshop and something in the program glitched because I had it up and you know it was like three weeks later when I came back to it and the program is still running. And all of a sudden the whole thing was selected and I thought, ah, oh, this is like the perfect thing to do, the idea of a selection of the text, you know, that, that somehow it's like the marching ant line. And so this, I don't have a video of this, but it actually, the text moves, it is, um, it's programmed to kind of come on and off so that, so that the selection process becomes really evident in, in the way that the text, you read the text. And here's the back. So there's this kind of shift from the sleekness of the front, almost this kind of, again, falls into this realm of ab advertising and to this kind of craziness of corporality of the back. You know, again, these hundreds and hundreds of wires, I should say thousands and thousands of wires, that, that shift and move back to the kind of brain center that moves things around. I'm always interested in juxtapositions of objects, of material qualities, and oscillating between control and chaos. And so in this one, the front is hypnotic and seamless as a surface. The back becomes reminiscent of hair, again, map lines and supports an anxiety that's associated with those parts of the body. This is a work that I finished not too long ago. I was asked uh, to participate in, um, in a project that dealt with the idea of sight at Southern Oregon University at the Schneider Museum. And uh, you know, even though I work, my work obviously deals with space in very specific ways, I think about, you know, I don't necessarily like to uh, say installation or I don't necessarily like to say sculpture, even though like obviously it falls under those things, but I think about my practice as a spatial practice. So like I may make photographs, I may uh, make sculpt, you know, create sculptures or do some printmaking or it, it's all over the place. But I think the, the thing that um, really ties everything together is that there is a consideration of space and how space can be uh, 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 socially constructed and politically motivated. So when I was asked to deal with space, I don't work with site specificity. I, my works are always site negotiated, right? But it's not site specific. Uh, and I wanted to take on that challenge. And instead of going into the museum, I decided to make a uh, garden because I've been a big fan of topiaries for a really long time. I've been wanting to make a topiary and um, I didn't quite make a topiary because it didn't fit with the idea here of sight, but I'm, I will one day. Um, so yeah, so I started to kind of think about this. There's a space right outside of the museum that 
was always just blank, but it's a great con confluence of people walking in from the library and walking back from the art building and all the different type parts of campus. And I, I wanted to kind of work with that, uh, that area. So I made a landscape for birds, butterflies, bees, uh, humans, and yeah, and humans. And it's a site-specific sculpture that is arranged from shrubs, grasses, ground covers, and flowers that respond to the environmental conditions of the Rogue Valley. So uh, uh, this is just, um, it just very recently went in, in March. So it's kind of a baby. And it's, it was really interesting. Generally, when I make work, like you make work and it's done. But with this, you make work and it's just starting. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing because <laughs> like the plants are so young still and it really needs to grow. So some part of the idea was I went down there and I started to look and I think, you know, I don't always feel very comfortable th making work that is site specific because I feel like I need to be invested in the site and I can't just pop in somewhere and be invested in that site. Like that, there's no connection in some ways. Um, and so, but I was just cruising through the, uh, through the map sections, because you know, when all else fails, go to the map section, <laughs> that might give you some ideas. I was cruising through the map sections and I was looking at, uh, looking at the maps of the area and I was really struck by the words Indian territory, you know, and thinking about like land in this timeline that's really different than the timeline that we understand it, and thinking about how plants also confuse and um, extend that, because that, that timeline is also really different of the earth and of the plants and of the people that occupied the land. So it's, I, I, was, I was interested in uh, using that idea of territory uh, because it has these historical associations that reflect upon colonialism, conquest, and questions surrounding, uh, surrounding sovereignty of land. And so, but I, w I was kind of wanting to work with that in, in a very material way. So even though this actually reads very specifically, you could see it and this is what it looks like from 20 feet high on top of the museum. Um, the, my hope is that all of this will kind of grow and it'll grow outside of these lines and they'll start to confuse the words themselves, right? So that we won't be able to read it once these things grow, once these plants grow. And um, one of the kind of coolest part of the project was I, I was looking around for a landscape person because I don't know really anything about plants other than the fact that I really wanted to do this plant project. And a lot of my work kind of starts out that way that I don't know anything <laughs> about what I'm doing and I connect with some people that help me along the way, a lot of people that help me along the way. But um, I think one of the most kind of interesting parts of this project was the person that helped me with the plants was a, um, is like super, like this, she's so super knowledgeable and so invested in, in native plants and that was a really kind of informative way of thinking about this work. Uh, yeah, so I'm really excited to see how this will grow because currently I love the way that there are these different ways that you could look at it, like up high, this is coming from the library and uh, whoops, whoops. And yeah, so there are these just different ways of seeing something that you can't see the whole of, right? That there's no way of kind of identifying, you can't really tell what the letters are. But hopefully as the plants start growing and taking over the borders and boundaries of, of what I have mapped out, that's when the work will really kind of reach its fruition. But what I found most interesting actually was the process, you know, this other part, like this was my favorite. <laughs> I wish I could leave it like this. Um, and I've been kind of a fan of Gada Amir's um, earth, kind of earthworks or gardens that she has created. And she did this amazing, I don't know if any of you are familiar with her work, but she did this really amazing piece where she dug out love uh, for, on, in the ground. And it's like the most, you know, it's just like a most amazing kind of work anyway. But I was really kind of inspired to leave it that way, but they wouldn't let me leave it like this. <laughs> so I really had to continue with my, with my plant, plant ideas. So yeah, so the, um, the plants were selected for their potential to provide a habitat for the connectivity of wildlife, their ability to thrive in drought tolerant conditions, 
and their intrinsic capacity, be it edible, medicinal, or functional as pollinators, to promote a diverse ecosystem that benefits the larger landscapes of the valley, landscape of the valley. So in this formation, and then I started to kind of question about this idea of native, like what does it mean to be native? Because that's also a really kind of uh, <laughs> fraught, you know, and it's like we can't just have native plants because we have to like think about the introduction of the immigrant plants. So then I introduced some immigrant plants into the mix and also some plants that are uh, called new natives, which are new native, you know, this is like landscape ter terminology that I'm using. But, uh, but I don't know, it's, it, it's kind of interesting that when you make a piece and there's a certain set of intentions and all of a sudden like you start to kind of examine those intentions around it, like well, how does that actually play out? Not theoretically, it's kind of an interesting idea, but how does that play out in the world that we live in today? Okay, anyway, I am going to, this is, uh, this is what I've, I'm up to. I generally don't show works in progress, but I, I left the studio to come here to give this lecture after days and days of, you know, kind of sleepless studio time. Uh, so let me, let me talk to you a little bit about this. Uh, these are uh, intaglio and relief prints that I have been making. And this is the work that will be at the Dalles uh, through the summer. So if you are around, you can, you can check it out. Um, uh, whoops, a few years ago, I, I was, uh, I started receiving a lot of uh, bills in the mail because I was, I was pregnant and about to have my child. And before that, you know, I, I, I really had like dealt with all of my mail online. So I never really received a lot of mail. So I didn't realize that there's this kind of beautiful um, security envelope patterns that, 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 that are, that are kind of, that we get through the mail. There's like this kind of ornamentation that comes with these medical bills and, and, and whatnot. And I started to become really kind of interested and started to collect the, the security envelopes. And a lot of them are grids. There are grid patterns that have been printed and a lot of them are also decorative and, uh, and or ornamental in a, in a particular way. And I was really intrigued by thinking about how I could turn this, how I could turn the index of these, um, these ways that we kind of come across these beautiful aesthetic objects in our daily experience and how there's also like a twist in that because I don't know, there's something about ornament, it's surreality, uh, there's something intriguing and hypnotic and then there's also something that happens with this idea of veiling, I feel like. So uh, I was trying to figure out the form as like a carrier of this. I knew I wanted to print them and not just print them out as a photograph. Their kind of um, tactile quality was really important. So, so that's why they are intaglio. And I don't know if any of you know what an intaglio process is, but when you create an intaglio, you're actually creating a line into material and then you press ink to it. and it's embossed, so the line becomes really raised. And there's a kind of like, you know, th there's a be really beautiful surface, but it's also a violence, like it's a violent gesture on the paper. So I kind of wanted to capture that with these. Um, and yeah, they're, these, they're kind of in formation and they're floating in these um, uncontextualized backgrounds, which is what I was interested in achieving. So they're going to be stacked in formation, and, uh, and so these patterns are gonna be stacks of, stacks of formations, or stacked in formations across the space of the gallery. I think I accidentally tossed out a couple of the images that I was gonna show, but uh, let me see. Sorry, I'm gonna go forward and come back, okay. Uh, alongside of that, uh, I was, um, maybe I'll just read this little bit that I wrote about this. I'm attentive to modes of contradiction that comprise a situation rather than a singular understanding. This removes the work from the condition of unity that the world politics governmentally connotes to an examination of politics in everyday life, a self-reflexive means of understanding the structural blindness that permeates and creates systems of control. I have always been interested in the vulnerability of subjective truths and find it engaging to address difference, namely individual vision conflated upon what one can't individually change. The veneer lifts and things get messier rather than more organized. Something becomes illuminated rather than illustrated. 
So, uh, so yeah, so this body of work that is kind of response to the idea of social security brought about the pile of bills that I received um, when, when my son was born. And I also love the fact that they could also be this, this postpartum document, you know, because they index this kind of, this, like every single bill that I pretty much received through the mail at that time. But I, I also like that there's this shift between the postpartum document and a kind of rumination on what it means to be a citizen at this very moment, you know, and, and how we kind of, how we exist in the world as citizens and what does it mean to be socially secure. And uh, particularly because it seems like security is, you know, science says like security is one of the first things you need to feel in order to be, do anything else, like historically or, uh, or genetically that has been really important to us. And I also find the patterns to be also really interesting in, their, in the fact that they do trace a type of a genetic code, right? We think about uh, like modernism's um, ideal of like decontextualizing the relationship of uh, form or texture or pattern. But in essence, like there is this kind of history or, or genetic coding, aesthetic coding that happens through these patterns and ornamentations that are then brought onto this. So alongside, sorry, it's so out of, out of whack a little bit, but alongside those is gonna be a light piece that, that does spell out social security and this will be done <laughs> this will be done uh, in a few days, <laughs> but here is, uh, it's just getting right. I just wanted to show you just the part of it, of what it does. So s social and security are, ne are on two different walls, and once when social is on, security is off. So right now, so security now is going through its go thing. And, and I'm going to get those capacitors over. There's the my... And then they kind of blink on like that. So they take turns going on and off. So once, yeah, so when social is on, security is off and, and onwards. And I just thought there was something kind of interesting about, again, that conflating that personal experience of getting these things in the mail, but it is something that is not personal at all, right? Like we are all having this experience of receiving these. And then thinking about it historically through time, right? Like to the genesis of, of the image and the pattern. And then, um, and then bringing it back as, as this kind of a personal document. So this is the work that will be at the Dalles. Uh, the work that, this is another work that I've just finished um, that is at, uh, that will be at PSU with a few other, I'm just showing you the images or a couple of other things that will be there. But I was interested in thinking about that idea of the artifacts. I just talked about time through time, like the idea of the patterns through time or the idea of plants through time. And I was kind of interested in thinking about certain objects through time. These are some rocks that I picked up at Persepolis, and which is a historic site in, in Iran. And uh, I, I was... I love the idea of them as a strata of empire because they were rocks probably, well, I sh probably shouldn't have picked them up. They're probably Ill stolen, right? But they're, they're, when you look at them closely, there's the facets of the columns. So they're not just a rock, but they were actually shaped into something by hand. And there's this kind of shift between something that uh, came up from a geologic space <laughs> and was, uh, turned into service of empire and then fell down again. And, and I don't know, there's something really kind of magical to them about, magical, uh, there's something magical about them to me. And uh, I've, I've been like fascinated by rocks for a while, but not in a geologic sense, but as in rock throwing and like this kind of like idea of self-defense or violence that is evoked in them. And I think there's, I don't, I don't know, I like that kind of read of it to be in all of those spaces, the geologic state of empire or the relationship of geology as a strata of empire and then onwards to the violence of the rocks. Here's the other two images. They're actually separate images. I just put them into one because they're kind of a diptych. And then, uh, and then this rug image that I've been kind of thinking ab about a lot recently the idea of uh, fantasy and escape that is evoked with this uh, very quintessential um, mid, you know, Middle Eastern object. Uh, and the fact that it's this object of labor and object of beauty and it's something that you sit on and sleep on and stand on and eat on and 
uh, and it has this, his, its own kind of history that has been erased um, in service of aesthetics. And maybe I will end there. Thank you.
I don't want to say diffuse, but that makes it some, but in some ways like open, open it up uh -huh. in a variety of different ways, like open up its potential for meaning. Yeah. And decentralize it rather than look at it so singular. Yeah, as a specific thing. Yeah. yeah. This into a question I have actually about how both like materially got um, a very kind of like minimal amount of information and then conceptually um, because of the political content it's probably um, I imagine easy to go overboard you know like how I'm curious how you make the decisions of how much information is enough not too much both visually and Like, is there a, kind of a place where you know there's a balance, not too much is being given away, but enough? Right. Yeah, I don't know if I think about that. Like, I think, you know, like, I think I just have this, like, it ends up being what it is. You know what I mean? Like, there's, um, I, I was talking with someone about the idea of the politics in my work, because I don't necessarily think of my work as political, you know, but I just, I came to art making, uh, really late and through ceramics, and I became interested in ceramics because of the way it kind of uh, taught, it has a particular community around it, and uh, it had this kind of back to land movement. Uh, and this was my introduction to it anyway. So like, I was really interested in the idea of objects and the importance of the object and how it could circumvent like, this kind of capitalist model of, of overproduction and, you know, and, and this kind of reclamation of agency to the individual as a maker. I think maybe that goes back to that question of why objects. I think that is also important there as well. Um, and so when I started to make move, you know, when I started to make art, it had I wasn't steeped in art history. I was more steeped in like thinking about writing and theory and art, not art history. And so I think that's where I gravitated towards. Those are my set, set of concerns that just translated over. And I have a kind of um, a long um, interest in reading. And so books became a really important way for me to think about the way I would situate work. So thinking about narrative as a dislodged and decentralized in a dis dislodged and decentralized way came from writing more than it came from actually art history or art, and through that through film films as well. Those two things became really important in the way I started to move and um, make available. Because I do think there's also like art making with artists and art making. You don't want to ever tell anybody what to think, right? Like there's, that's not an intention, but hopefully through a cer certain set of circumstances, you start a questioning. And I think that's what I'm kind of interested in. That it shouldn't, the work doesn't, it sh doesn't need to encompass all of those aspects of things. That in some ways you can learn yourself from the process of making. Is So I noticed in some of your earlier work, in your earlier works that, um, that deal with letters or words, that the, they're physical, like objects, or they're wood, they're not, they're framed or they're propped up by light, but they're not made out of light or light fixtures. Mm -hmm. And in some of your later work, I noticed that there were words or letters constructed from light, like the social security mm -hmm. piece. I wonder where that uh, what, like, permitted you or what caused you to search. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, I think that it was that uh, I, I talked about going to see the, the Kurt Files uh, uh, songs and then being struck by it was, you know, the Mac, uh, Mac and I song was sung in German and of course it sounded like so much more exciting than that. <laughs> and then I just looked at that particular stanza that's actually not in most of the uh, the songs that have been covered. It's like, a, for some reason, that stanza is never in any of the American versions of the song. Um, and I talked about putting it into um, Photoshop. And 
that glitch in Photoshop is what instigated that shift because I was interested in creating a selection tool like that the text could be in selection similarly to the way you talked about darkness and light being <coughs> selection and so then I just thought about which like, the only light that could do that is a LED light and so it, yeah that's somehow like I like the way the material feeds the content of the work and the content also can feed the materiality moving forward. I was getting kind of sick of using fluorescent, but you know, I was like, I don't want to be a fluorescent lighter. <laughs> it was just like, I, I, I used it really specifically because I didn't want to use sculpture material. I think my intention was never to make sculpture because I thought that sculpture was the thing that happened in the past. <laughs> it has like this kind of history that's complicated, right? And I, I, I like the idea of not making objects and somehow I make objects but not make objects because of maybe the fragility or the fact that I am or in many parts or um, that I have to like take everything apart every time I deinstall like, all of those things were really important ways of thinking about a decentralized object. Yeah, and somehow because it's like And then, you know, like lately, I just, I, I think about it too, I, I don't like it in a similar way that I don't like that you have to plug it in. Like I was starting to feel like, like, I don't like the idea of plug, it's like the artificial, artificiality of it. And I think the work that I showed, that piece that I made in grad school, um, I didn't like the artificiality, like it's so theatrical in, in the worst way that art history talks about it. And I, yeah, there's something about like, I was kind of interested in Real, the real thing, and uh, somehow the fluorescents fall into that real thing, even though you have to plug them in and take them out. You know? I think what another thing that um, has been really influential is uh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on his name? You know, the lights. <laughs> the, uh, Terrell? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>